All right, so for, for those, uh, Cliff Johnson again here from the FAA, from uh, the Tech Center Atlantic City. Um, next two topics are, are somewhat related, and you know I'll do them back to back. But um, the first one is more on ADSB data um, and and some data mining and uh, gap analysis that we've been working on um, for a couple different mission segments that I want to uh, update the group on. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about our uh, our flight data monitoring work for uh, the you know mainly in support of the SIS program, but uh, flight data monitoring in general. Uh, as well that you guys have seen uh, from me over the years. So let's see here, always hit the wrong button. So um, one of the things you can use ADSB data for is anomaly detection. That's what we were primarily looking at with uh, our work here. So um, the way you kind of do this in flight data records is traditionally, right, anomaly detection is based upon exceedance analysis, right? So parameter X, you know, does not exceed. For instance, an example might be uh, overbank, right? You, your bank angle exceeds 60 degrees, right? That's an event, right? That because that's an exceedance. You've exceeded the parameter, right? If you go beyond VNE, right? I mean, you never want to do that, right? But if you did on your airspeed, right? That's another exceedance, right? And so on and so forth. So you could you could you could go through any of these different kind of single or multiple parameter um, exceedances, right? And that's that's the traditional means, right? You monitor that parameter, weight, set a threshold. In certain cases, it's below what the POH is or the RFM, right? And you monitor that. And then when it gets exceeded, you make, you know, make an event uh, out of it and everything. So that's one way to do it. Um, but, you know, that requires you to go through the record and every single parameter has to be monitored uh, and managed, right? Um, when you start looking at large and large amounts of data, such as, you know, the entire, say, rotorcraft fleet or even the fleet within a given operator or mission segment, right? You can still do that, but it takes time. Um, and, you know, in certain cases, right, is it, is it really telling the story? Um, so one of the things that we've been looking at from the research program and the effort is, can we start looking at, like, typical, like, anomaly detection um, for trend analysis, right? Can we look at, are there patterns in the data, right? And one of the things might be, you know, typical groupings of flights, right? Which one of these does not look like the other, um, for instance, right? Where things deviate from the normal routes. Um, and, and this also has the benefit of helping the folks that we're working with identify what are their normal uh, routes, right? How are they being flown, right? Um, which can help in SOPs and different things as you go forward, right? So that's that's important. So we're looking at that aspect of things. Um, the way you do this is you typically take the ADSB data and you split it in two. Um, you know, there's the positional data that's important, right? The lat lawn, and then there's the altitude data. Um, the altitude data tends to be a little bit noisier than um, the positional data, uh, and there's some reasons for that, and we'll talk about it. Uh, but essentially what you do here is you transform it. So the FPCA stands for Functional Principle Component Analysis. I'm not going to go into all the details of the math and everything behind it, uh, but the idea is basically you're doing a transformation from, you know, one particular space into another, um, and that way you can look at stuff, um, you know, in terms of trying to identify these clusters in the flights and the outliers, right? And if you do that, you can kind of um, settle it down from what it looks like with all these spaghetti plots and everything into essentially, okay, here is, you know, my nominal track and then here's my outliers, right? And then that helps, that helps understand where your bounds are at. So we're going to talk about the method for that, how we've done that and show some results for two communities. Um, and the two that we've looked at were really two operators. Uh, one was an air tour operator, and the other one was a uh, air ambulance uh, operator. The way this works is the ADSB data comes in as a raw data, so it's captured off of all of the ADSB ground stations in the FAA network. We then take the that data, um, and it typically comes in in like a uh, in a format. Um, gets it into a CSV file, right? And then there's some pre-processing that we do on that file to be able to pull out the rows and everything because it's essentially time series data. There's trajectory data in there, which is, you know, essentially the positional data and the altitudes. Um, 
and then there's a sequence, right? So what, which record comes, you know, after another one, right? Denoted by the time series. But sometimes the things can come in out of order, um, and that's because of the fact that you're getting hits from different ground stations at different times, right? Based on when you saw uh, the signal, right? So we take that there, um, we apply some processing on it, right? To take the data that we have from raw data and then um, get some features out of it, right? And then you can start to do clustering and find the right grouping of the data. Uh, similarly, you could take the trajectory data, um, and then one of the things that we did on that was what does it look like, right? What what does it represent in terms of an image, right? Then it's then it becomes an image processing problem. Um, you can pull out certain features of the data, um, you know, to try and resize it. You can look at a histogram, and you know, I'll show some of that of what we do that. And then lastly, you can start to classify that again with the idea that you're trying to you know, bucket things into different clusters. And then from there, you're trying to find the outliers in the data set, right? Because that's the important thing, right? We want to find the, you know, the, the flight that was the anomaly, right? For whatever reason, it was a return to base event. If there was, um, you know, some maneuvers that were in there that weren't, uh, that weren't indicative of what would normally be seen, you know, all those different things. Um, Looking at it again here, uh, again, just on the process so that everybody's familiar with how we're doing it. We, we, for these two operators for this study, we, for this case study, if you will, we took the daily flight data logs and records that we had. Um, we checked them against the segments for the time. We do some filtering based on uh, duration, altitude thresholds to eliminate some of the noise and different things we have in the data. Um, then we go back and we look at uh, the airfield data, right, which, you know, we, we've we done, you know, both from the 5010 and the different uh, data sources for this and everything, um, combine them, right, and then segment the, uh, the flights and, and different things off of here. Um, it, this looks like a lot, but just, just FYI, uh, it's something we're still working on. I think we're getting better at, but there are some data quality issues with the data that we've, we've been looking through and going through. It's not perfect. And this is in addition to, you know, some of the coverage issues. So this is speaking more to just the way that the data is. Um, we've had some issues where, you know, there's, there's time gaps in the flights. Uh, there's really like short flights where it got picked up. Right. And then it turned into a track. And then how do you combine those? There's things that are like, you know, it starts in the air. Right. Which is understood because you don't have coverage over a certain uh, below a certain altitude. There's some speeds and everything. So kind of have to work through all these. But we've we've gotten better at, at dealing with a lot of these issues with uh, the processing and the, and the work that we're doing. Um, another one you'll see is kind of like the fluctuation in altitude data. Right. So you get some of these ones that come up here in some of the flight segments where it goes, you know, it's not a smooth track, right? You, you may have a couple like little ripples for the spikes here, right? But then I've got some of these ones that are like, you know, large discontinuities. So, um, you know, not really sure. We, we haven't really investigated uh, enough as to why we're seeing that. We just, you know, we, it does show up from time to time in the data set there, um, you know, and it, you know, the way to handle that was really just to cut off you know, some of this stuff. So for instance, like on this flight, um, it's pretty, you know, I, I mean, looking at it and knowing the operation that it is, it's pretty reasonable that this is like at 2,500 feet or whatever the, the altitude is here. It's not quite, I wouldn't quite call it 3,000. It's not going up to 10,000 and you're not in between there, right? It's pretty, a pretty constant one, uh, but there is some noise there, right? So how do you, how do you do that? How do you deal with that? That's just some of the stuff that we've had to, had to do. And, you know, again, um, but there's there's different ways that you have to do that. Just to show you, you know, again, some of the jumps and everything, you have to account for that in the uh, in the programming and everything as it's as it's coming in raw. It's not perfect, um, so that's that's what you do. Um, the other one that we've seen as well, and some of the stuff has been duplicate helipads, and um, you know, we worked with um, you know with with Dave. Um, you know, and I think Josh on, on some of this as well, they were very kind enough to provide some of the files of what they're, what they're dealing with here. Um, right. But some of these ones are, are, are labeled, you know, certainly in, in, you know, certain location information, right. And, in, in, you know, like in the 5010 or whatever, but then they're labeled something else in, in the other system. So again, just, just being cognizant of that so that we're not overcounting or overfitting. 
so anyway, so so I'll talk about the two data sets that we have right now. And the first one was on the air tour side. So again, that was grouped by takeoff and landing sites. And we looked at a subset of data um, in, in Hawaii, um, which was based upon, you know, about 365 flights. Um, and this shows on this screen kind of a sample set of uh, data from Honolulu to Kalealoa. Um, and as you see on here, there's, you know, the different ones at, at the different locations, which were, were sort of the destinations. And these kind of line up with a lot of the tour routes that um, the one operator we looked at were flying. You can, again, here see here's like the altitude plot, and then here's the smooth plot, um, and then here's, uh, you know, some of the other ones, and then here's how it kind of sh uh, shows out. There are subgroups that, that occur if you actually, um, you know, go through this and you filter everything down. Um, you start to see these clusters that, ap that appear, um, you know, regarding dur duration of the flight, um, you know, flight duration in the area um, that you've gone over, um, you know, here. So, you know, essentially thinking of the distance, right? So, so within that subgroup, right, of uh, Hilo to Hilo, right, on the Big Island, right, there are, uh, there are flights that go, um, you know, in these, uh, you know, different areas, right? And then there's some other stuff that, that go back and and fourth there, Hilo being the largest one, right? But then there's other ones that correspond to other islands, right? It's not it's not a homogenous data set, if you will, right? Even though there are certain patterns, right? There are, uh, you know, looking at this, there are things that, that occur and there are flights within, you know, certain things, which makes sense because of the distributed nature of the tours, right? So again, you can go through there, here's a sample looking at, you know, what we see from altitude. So one of the things you can look at here is you look at the altitude traces here of um, you know what's uh, you know what's typically being flown, and you can see what the what altitudes you know these are typically at, and you start seeing you know things that repeat in the data, right? Like okay, there's a level off here, right? And then there's a climb at a certain point, and you start seeing you know um, trajectories that look very similar, and you can apply some learning um, things to these, right? And then you can try to compare and say, well, okay, flight one is like flight two, is like flight three, is like flight four, right? Um, and then you can start grouping them that way. Um, this is helpful in the case where you may not know where the destinations are, where you're trying to say, hey, this looks like the signature of an air tour flight, um, you know, per se. Um, you know, there's certain things that, that stick out at you. And you can you can do some statistical analysis doing it that way. Gets a little bit into like the image and pattern recognition, but um, kind of shows you what you're dealing with. You can do the same thing for position if you plot uh, latitude and longitude as well, right? You know, to overlay these tracks or to look at, you know, a segment of your track that you may want to look at. Um, this has come up here recently with some of the discussions that people have had over like overflights or things within, um, you know, certain areas. I, I know, you know, the noise has been a big one, um, you know, with, with certain areas and different things that you have. Um, so being able to see like wh what the tracks are of certain uh, things. Again, this is, this is publicly available, you know, ADSB, FAA surveillance data. Um, so, you know, it, may be able to uh, to help in that regard as well. Okay, there's also additional um, things from the uh, air medical data set that we've looked at, which is, um, again, you know, our friends in Maine, <laughs> you know, we, we, we looked at this one as well. So we had um, almost uh, 600 flights here that we were looking at in, uh, in different groups, and you can start seeing how they, how they break out here. And what happens is really that the compared to the air tour data set, your takeoff and landing sites are, are a little bit more distributed. They're not concentrated, you know, as much in say, you know, these, um, you know, five or six uh, heliports or airports. Um, you know, they're they're definitely more, and that that gets to the point that was made earlier today about the routing. You know, there's more routes that are out there as well. Um, so just a, as a highlight, we looked at this, we, we need to expand this now um, that we, we did it, uh, you know, with the first set, but we looked at uh, three of the, uh, the tail numbers um, with, within, I guess it was, if I'm counting that right there, it's about like a, a nine month period um, there. And we came up with a total of about 900 flights, about 1600 flight hours 
um, here's a visualization of what you can see with looking at this. Again, just a basic altitude plot of a, a, a you know, kind of a sample flight here. Um, you know, this was a short one, only took about 18, 20 minutes, right? And then here's here's the route that was flown um, as well. And you can you can kind of see that based upon um, you know the latitude longitude track. Um, to get back uh, again, we also took a look and try to explain or at least uh, validate what we were doing with um, in regards to the uh, top 10 routes that um, occurred for uh, for uh, you know for this operator for life flight of Maine essentially um, and then what we saw is that we, we pretty much were in, in alignment with the ones that life flight actually flies which is good um, but part of the problem was with some of the ADSB data um, you know, we couldn't conclusively say, you know, this was the 68 ME to say MEO2 segment. We realized it probably was, but just with some of the uh, segmentation in the ADSB. Now we're going back to look at that to see if we can clean that up and get that a little bit better. Um, it's something we need to go through, but it's at least a starting point, right? Um, so then this just shows you here um, on one of them, right? There's 68 flights and here's, here's all of them overlaid on the tracks. And here's their altitude data. You can do the same thing here uh, for MEO2. And we tried to look at this based upon the routes that are flown and the routes that are coming up from, um, you know, the infrastructure work, just so that we could kind of help in the selection of what is the next route that needs to get prioritized um, as we go through. So we looked at that. We looked at, um, you know, the, the other stuff for MEO2. So again, I'm not going to uh, belabor it too much, but I just, uh, these are, you know, kind of the rest of the, uh, the routes and the tracks and you can see the, the same thing that we've done there um, so what are we doing in the future so we have more work to do we want to look at which I didn't brief today is we have another initiative um, which was started by Scott Terrell and uh, Lee Roscop out at the directorate um, to work with some of the participating operators and compare the ADSB flight hours to uh, what would essentially be like operator recorded uh, flight hours. So the stuff that goes into the GA survey, uh, right, with either Hobbs or TAC time. Um, we want to look at some of the statistical analysis of the ADSB tracks compared to onboard data that is recorded, um, essentially like using like four flight or other helicopters. Uh, that could help identify where some of these errors and things that we're seeing in the ADSB data is coming from. Um, you know, and potentially look at, hey, are we getting, you know, more of an authoritative, you know, onboard data source, which would be better uh, for analysis than the ground-based stuff. Um, we're also starting to look at space-based ADSB. Um, that may provide some additional insights. Not sure yet if the update rate or the coverage will be better, but, you know, we, we have our fingers crossed and we're hoping that it potentially could be. And then additional gaps in coverage, right, at low altitudes, right? We all know it's an issue. We get into terrain and masking. Uh, is there, can we identify where those coverage gaps are? Again, going back to, you know, what flight hours are flown. If we can do that for certain operators in certain parts of the country, uh, right, then we can identify, okay, well, we have gaps with the system here because, you know, you're reporting that you flew for 10 hours and the ADSB is only picking up eight hours, right? Well, then where did those other two hours go, right? And we can go back and look at that. I know we have the coverage maps that are available on Google Earth from the SPS program office, and they're, they're a big help, don't get me wrong, um, but certainly it can help kind of guide decisions on, you know, where do, where does industry or the community want to, you know, maybe install additional coverage, um, you know, that could potentially be at, at these heliports, right? Um, there's, there's some thoughts to to doing that, um, you know, to get to get better coverage at low altitude, um, and then some of the ADSB heliport metrics that we've been talking about doing um, for the the work that we're doing for ASIAS and for other um, FDM, um, you know, research again counts of takeoffs and landings at various locations like heliports, and then this can feed its way into the risk analysis and other metrics that I briefed about yesterday. So. Anyway, so that's what we're doing on ADSB. I'm happy to take any questions, and uh, and then I will queue up the next one on uh, FDM. Awesome, uh, Cliff. Uh, great uh, presentation. Um, anyone that uh, is online and has any questions, feel free to come off mute or put something in the chat uh, while we're waiting. Um, 
I know the one thing you touched on was improving the coverage. I know we talked about this before. Is when you look at uh, doing that, is that something that would be done through the FAA or would that be a third party entity? Because I know that there are several applications that you can download today on your phone that shows you ADSB data with an overlay, um, FlightAware, Radar24, and several others. Uh, but that's not something the FAA does. So in trying to get better coverage, if we were to get ADSB receivers at these heliports, um, who who would who would spearhead something like that, and um, how would that then connect? What would be the connectivity? Hey, that's a good question, Rex. Um, you know, I, I mean, my personal opinion on it is um, there's been some talk and some discussion uh, with the FAA, like with the weather camera program and some of the ASOS and AWAS stations where they are putting um, some of those installations in place. Um, the, and I don't know if anybody's on the call from the SBS program office or the ADSB office that could correct me, but I think the current thinking, at least what I've seen, and there's been some precedents that have been uh, done for this, have been, there's actually been encouragement of the community to put, um, you know, to, you know, fund, these type of things if if they need better coverage in a certain area to uh, to work with uh, L3 Harris and either fund you know an installation or um, for folks to go out and, on their own and you know you can put your own you know receiver together um, and everything um, certainly I mean I wouldn't recommend you know doing that to get it into the the network but I think you know there are companies that could provide this service and uh, I, I think, you know, we, we always have concerns about some of the integrity and, and data quality of the signals that are coming in that are maybe not FAA certified equipment. But I think that can be uh, that can be mitigated in this this case and certainly something I would want to would want to look at, um, you know, because I think the more data and the better we can get into the system, you know, the better off we're all going to be. But there is there is limitations. I don't. I don't see this as a as a program where, say, the FAA, just based on what I know from in the past and everything, is necessarily going to support, say, the installation of ADSB ground stations at every vertiport going forward for uh, helicopters and UAM. Um, but I do see kind of a path forward where um, maybe an industry provider steps up to fill that void. But that's just my thought. Now I see a, um, a question on our chat from uh, Joshua. Uh, Dixon said that will the third party receivers from uh, companies such as FlightAware or FlightTrack24 fill that gap? Um, he makes a comment that they were giving them away a couple of years ago. And you, you, you talked about data quality, but I don't know, is yeah. that something that may happen? I, I think it's worth exploring um, with some of these things. I think the thing to remember is the fact that there's there's been some hesitancy on um, behalf of the ADSB program to take um, in other data sources. They haven't really stopped uh, any individual from going out, creating your own receiver um, and using it. Um, I know that, you know, in the cases of like FlightAware and um, 24 Radar and some of those other ones, right, that data um, it typically will come off of, say, the FAA uh, ASDI feed that goes out to industry, right? But then those companies put their own receivers out and, and do different things. So, um, it gets into, and this is something we're, we're trying to look at, and I, we need to do, you know, kind of a one-to-one -one comparison for, you know, single helicopter um, on the flights. And I, I, the only thing I really go back to is kind of what we did with our helicopter as well as what I saw um, when we did some of the stuff with the tour ops guys. And that is that it's not, you know, it, it's good to an extent. Right, but it's limited in in terms of some of your range and some of the uh, the signal uh, characteristics, right? And and that maybe that's fine for right at a heliport, right? But it may not be sufficient if you're trying to traverse, you know, um, you know, the far reaches of Maine, if you will, um, for certain <laughs> things as you get into like you know issues with terrain and mountains and masking. So a long story short is I don't know, um, but I do know that there have been some issues with. Um, you know, with, you know, like receivers that are not of a certain quality before. Um, right. You know, so it's something we just would have to explore. 
Well, it's, 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 um, yeah. How big is it? How do you connect it? How much does it cost? Where do you put it? You know, all those questions need to be answered, but uh, we may reach out to L3 Harris and see if we can have that discussion and see if that's something, you know, the USHST can champion at some point down the road as well. I got one other question here from uh, our good friend, Tom Judge, um, asking, are, are you hearing concerns about 5G interfering with GPS signal and reliability? Um, light squared issue is, is what he's pointing yeah, to. Yeah, um, that's a good question, Tom. Um, actually, not as much as you would think uh, on, say, the GPS and the ADSB, um, but it has come up as a big concern for the radio altimeters. Uh, there was a RTCA uh, study that was done, um, and it led to a position paper, uh, which actually was brought up when, you know, the uh, uh, I guess whatever it is, the, whichever 5G, you know, uh, network was brought up or one of the things here recently, um, which I think the Spectrum auction. And that came up at, particularly because there were some things that were identified in there um, where it could cause some interference. And, you know, we saw this years ago with our helicopter um, with one of the, the technicians that was uh, doing an install. And um, we kept having a complaint from the pilots that every time um, they would fly, that the radio altimeters would go on haywire. And we, t we did everything we could on this. We changed the radio altimeters, we changed the boxes, we changed the wiring, we changed the sensors, we, we had all kind of stuff. Um, and then we finally found that one day what was happening was that the tech was working on something and he had his iPhone out. I think this was like iPhone six, seven or six or whatever it was. And it was uh, causing the radio altimeter to, to really go haywire, right? And he walked away and it, it went back to normal and then went back to it. And then he saw it going as well. Now, I don't know if that was, you know, maybe we didn't have something shielded right or correct, but, um, and I really think of it too much until we got, you know, back into the, this 5G area. So I think it is a concern. Uh, the GPS, not so much. There are some additional concerns about GPS um, in terms of security and everything that I, I think, you know, uh, you know, GPS jamming and spoofing, uh, but that's not necessarily a 5G issue. That's more of, uh, you know, just a, a general uh, kind of signals uh, problem. Okay. Um, I got one other question from Alex McIntosh. Uh, can ADSB offset the need for heli safety eight? ACT, TAWS, FDR, CVR? Uh, absolutely not, I don't think, in my opinion. Um, they're different technologies. Um, you know, ADSB is is great uh, for what we have, and, you know, people use it all the time, the ADSB in for, you know, traffic avoidance and different things, um, you know, but, uh, but the TAWS system, you know, is using the terrain data. Now, the terrain data might we might get to a point where maybe that's streaming and it's coming in via ADSB versus maybe some of the onboard uh, systems. If you could ensure good reliability and, and maybe the GPS, you know, works in real time to, to kind of update what the terrain looks like and, and other obstacles and things. I, I could see that, you know, um, you know, being a work. But as far as a, a replacement for FDM, uh, you know, and CVRs now, I mean, you definitely need, you know, the cockpit, uh, you know, recording, I believe, to give you a picture of what's going on. Um, ADSB doesn't transmit, you know, any of that information um, over the signal, um, not even, you know, kind of like what frequency we're on or anything that's not, uh, that's not part of the data set. Um, and when we get into everything like a flight data recorder, right, you want other information about the helicopter. And that kind of leads into my next briefing, but you want, you want the torques, you want the engines, you want the rotors, you want uh, the GPS positions and different things. And ADSB is great for giving you the GPS positions and the altitudes and some other uh, kind of derived parameters, but it's not going to give you the richness of the data set or the higher quality update rates that you're going to get with a, a flight data recorder. So I, I think you need all those technologies, but ADSB, uh, definitely glad we have it uh, compared to what we had before.